Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, and welcome to 2014-15 Bannon Institute on Ignatian Leadership. My name is Mick McCarthy. I am the Executive Director of the Ignatian Center for Jesuit Education here at Santa Clara. And this is kind of an ecumenical, uh, an ecumenical offering. We have the Ignatian Center sponsoring two folks from the Markala Center who are going to speak. So we're all, we're all of one team. Those of you who read the New York Times may have seen last Wednesday's article by Nick Bilton. It is entitled, The Shaky Moral Compass of Silicon Valley. The author argues that while Silicon Valley's catchphrase is we're making the world a better place, there are some ethical problems under our noses, like homelessness, significant homelessness. Uh, he cites frivolous luxuries that tech execs pursue and at times a lack of compassion. One professor of psychology and social behavior who is quoted in the article writes of the perils of excessive profit. I will quote, with money comes a decreased level of compassion toward other people and an increased focus on yourself. It isn't that it's making people bad, it just makes them more internally focused, end quote. Now, if this professor is correct, then the Jesuit University of Silicon Valley faces particular challenges. It is our aspiration, after all, to educate leaders and citizens of competence, conscience, and compassion. So to consider the future of leadership in Silicon Valley, we are fortunate to have two colleagues with us this afternoon. Kirk O'Hansen is the executive director, director of the Markola Center for Applied Ethics and is the John Courtney Murray SJ Professor of Social Ethics. And Skeet is director of leadership ethics at the same Markola Center. In addition to other things, she has served as CEO of American Leadership Forum Silicon Valley for eight years and previously as vice president of marketing for the San Jose Mercury News. I'm very pleased to have both of them to consider leadership crises in Silicon Valley a way forward. Please welcome Kirk Hansen and Anne Skeet. We're going to do a bit of tag team, uh, succeeding each other up here, and then we'll sit down for the Q&A and conversation. Uh, this day started out uh, talking about deflated footballs. Uh, which I did on NPR at 6.15 this morning. I thought perhaps that would be a good topic for the next 45 minutes, would be deflation of footballs. And then at our standard Monday morning discussion of ethical issues, uh, relevant ethical issues at the Markala Center, Brian Green, who's sitting here at the table, introduced the Catholic ethical approach to transhuman experiences, which uh, particularly living forever. And so he will be holding a uh, lengthy seminar afterwards uh, about uh, Catholic approaches to living forever. Uh, we're delighted, Ann and I are delighted to be uh, uh, invited to do this as part of uh, the series which the Ignatian Center uh, has uh, uh, sponsored this year. It is frankly an opportunity for us to try out some ideas. Uh, the context here is that um, two years ago we had a strategic planning exercise for the Markala Center which identified four themes, two of which are represented in this presentation. One was that we ought to focus more on leadership ethics and the second was we ought to double down on issues of importance in Silicon Valley, ethical issues of importance here. And so I went out looking for somebody who could come and bring both of those perspectives to the Ethics Center, and I'm delighted that Anne was willing to join us. Anne has an extensive background at the Mercury News and then uh, heading American Leadership Forum Silicon Valley. So she and I have been laboring in this same vineyard over many years, and, and as some of you know, I taught uh, a whole generation of, of leaders uh, in Silicon Valley uh, in my prior life doing executive education, MBA education at Stanford, and then here at Santa Clara. So uh, this is a reflection on what we think we have learned. It's only a starting point in a dialogue, and we hope that all of you will both ask questions, make comments, but also give us some feedback about productive directions to go.
So what we're going to talk about is what's our evaluation, what's our diagnosis of the ethical leadership crises in the Valley, and then a way forward, a few suggestions, including some Ignatian resources. So that's where we're going. We'll try to get our presentation done in 30 minutes and then leave plenty of time for conversation. So uh, this is uh, a perspective on leadership uh, in America, and we've divided it into four historical periods. This that I'm giving is the broad, not just Silicon Valley, but broader. And there was a sense in which uh, you get this when you get old people like me, you get the benefit of his historical analysis. Um, but in the 50s and 60s, we had an era of business statesmen, uh, community leadership, which was really quite benign. There was a sense in which um, uh, leaders saw their role as serving both the community as well as their institutions. And, of course, the flaw in that ointment was that it was white males and their role in the community and excluded racial minorities, women, etc. So it was not so benign uh, to uh, many of the people who, who were affected by that brand of leadership. But we, we saw many leaders who were exemplary, who demonstrated principles that I think we would all honor. In the 70s and 80s, you had a definite shift. And there was a sense in which shareholder primacy in business leadership came to be much more prominent. Uh, and so the, the concern over does a company exist solely for the benefit of its shareholders, or does it exist for a broader set of stakeholders? In the 50s and 60s, executives tried to balance those uh, uh, through their own set of values, their own sense of what was appropriate. In the, 70, in the 70s and 80s, there was much more of a narrowing uh, that resulted in different ways we taught business ethics, for example, uh, uh, different perspectives on the, the role that an executive plays and the prerogatives that an executive leader has in an organization. In other sectors besides business, there was a similar narrowing of the kind of perspective, we believe, taken by leaders. Um, it was an era of, of not just Watergate shock and the aftermath of that, but Wall Street insider trading, uh, defense industry scandals, remember the $600 coffee pot, uh, government corruption, a sense that there was venality that people had not seen before. Now, moving very, this is a real quick history. Moving to the 90s and the 2000s, at least it's our perception that there's a high watermark of self-interest and political uh, polarization in even the emergence nationally of many anti-leaders or examples of, of uh, horrendous uh, leadership. Um, and, and so that, that sense of you have obligations only to your shareholders came to be more prominent that I have obligations only to myself or perhaps constrained by a little bit of obligation to my shareholders. It came the me generation, the sense of self-promotion, the brand of me, uh, and that, that uh, focus on uh, I'm here to make it myself, not to make it on behalf of a broader community or a broader sense of leadership. So amongst my favorites, of course, are Enron, uh, WorldCom, uh, Health South and Leona Helmsley. And Leona Helmsley was the uh, uh, New York hotel owner who famously said when she was prosecuted for tax evasion, taxes? Taxes are for the little people, not for me. And uh, that was not a particularly moral kind of statement. Uh, or perhaps it was. Uh, sports, of course, Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa, Barry Bonds. Uh, it was an era of corked bats, steroids, and so on. In government, Newt Gingrich uh, represented a substantial shift in the focus on self, in the focus on your particular constituency, uh, rather than the broad concerns of uh, all of the citizens, in my view. We can have an argument about that one. Uh, Elliot Spitzer, John Edwards are two poster boys uh, of that era for, for uh, related reasons. Um, it was an era in which CEO salaries and the star system went crazy. The idea that the individual who emerged at the top of the sports pecking order or the business pecking order or even 
other kinds of organizations got excessive salaries, got much more multiples of what the average employee would make. And there was a sense in which that was, that was the proper state of things. But in any case, that's what happened. Um, scandals mer moved to the top, not just uh, down in organizations. Again, uh, resume fraud, we lost a lot of CEOs who, or, and other leaders uh, who had falsified their resumes. And uh, the way the WorldCom scandal emerged was when the CEO, in order to save a few dollars on uh, pictures that he had bought, illegally shipped them to another state so that he would not have to pay the sales tax on his uh, $100,000 paintings that he was buying. And then, of course, they discovered that, and then they discovered the scandals within uh, WorldCom. Um, all of that suggests that we reached a high watermark. Maybe you can argue that that wasn't the high water mark, that things have gotten worse, but at least uh, my perspective is that that was the high water mark. Uh, I think the 2010s, the last five or six years, has been a time in which we've come to recognize the costs of this crisis in leadership and a new rethinking about what is ethical leadership and what role does it play in a society. Um, in business, the, the uh, uh, 2008 recession and its aftermath helped us realize that, that major banks, distinguished organizations, could engage in widespread fraud in the sale of mortgage-backed securities, uh, could engage in mortgage processing with just total disregard for the interests of people that they were dealing with, the long tail of that uh, scandal is still being worked out day in and day out as banks are fined and as banks are required as B of A has just been last week to uh, make whole quite a number of people who went through bankruptcy but still were hounded uh, by B of A uh, after their bankruptcies. Uh, there were similar patterns in other areas. Lance Armstrong and Tiger Woods are two just incredible stories of individuals who who uh, reached the top and then fell with incredible uh, velocity uh, and uh, tragedy in, in, in both cases. Uh, in government, uh, of course, just the last few weeks, last uh, year and a half, uh, in the case of California, we have seen uh, the uh, uh, removal prosecution of the leaders of, of uh, state legislative bodies. Um, uh, and uh, uh, something that raises so many questions about the workings of government and the, the level of trust we can have in government. And of course, Brian Williams and the media, can you believe the media? Uh, and Brian Williams' exaggeration of the helicopter story and the New Orleans story and so on, uh, and his fall uh, is uh, indicative of, of concerns around uh, uh, the costs of leadership. So all of that leads, I think, to greater inequality, as we've seen the salaries continue to accelerate the 1% uh, share of the uh, wealth of the country, growing distrust in all leaders, rejection of traditional careers in big institutions. I don't know what you attribute the millennials' hesitancy about going to work for any kind of large organization, uh, but um, at least part of it, in my view, has got to be their sense, their lack of trust in the workings of those large organizations. And I, I would say a withdrawal of more educated women from large institutions. One of the things I track is the MBA grads of the last few years, and there are so many uh, uh, professional women who've gotten top-notch degrees in recent years and are in disproportionate share out of the workforce. Uh, and that comes from a lot of causes, including the class ceiling, but there's a certain sense in which they too distrust uh, the, uh, uh, the environment. The, uh, so here's, here's a summary of, I think, where we are uh, from this crisis in leadership, and that, that is the lack of trust in leaders leads to a lack of trust in the institutions that we all work in and live in, a withdrawal results from participation in politics, declining voting rates, declining uh, interest in serving in government, uh, withdrawal from all institutional life as there is this rush 
to entrepreneurial activity and to sole uh, professional uh, practitioners and so on. An unwillingness in government, uh, in our government process, to fund anything because we distrust government so badly, to fund health care, to fund um, social services and so on. Uh, even a willful disbelief in what scientists say because, of course, they're uh, as tainted by corruption as anyone else. That provides an opening for those who would deny climate change and other things. And a decline in general in empathy, compassion, uh, as we see our insensitivity to um, the thousands and even hundreds of thousands of people dying in the Mediterranean as immigrants uh, or the, the number of families that, that are in uh, 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 carcer incarceration in the United States due to uh, immigration irregularities and such. So all of that is uh, on our plates as a concern about the leadership crisis. I will turn it over to Anne who will talk more specifically about her perspective on what's happened here in Silicon Valley. Thank you, Kirk. <clears throat> My perspective isn't quite as long as Kirk's. Um, I arrived in Silicon Valley in 1990, but that's still 25 years of being here in the Valley, first at a media organization, and then as Kirk mentioned, at American Leadership Forum. And uh, so my observations come from uh, that, those experiences. Uh, so going back to the start, uh, to the timeline that Kirk began, the 1950s and 60s, really we were known as the Valley of Heart's Delight, and this was the beginning of our switch from, uh, as I like to say, from fruit to Fairchild, from uh, all the orchards and um, the agricultural business. We were actually the largest uh, packing and growing fruit um, source in the world here. Um, but at the same time, world events were starting to draw people's interest in the valley to other things. And uh, Sputnik is actually pointed to as a moment when the valley kind of realized, the United States kind of realized that others around the world were getting past us a bit in an area that we held uh, to be one of our own pr preeminence, which is sort of in the science and technology uh, frontier. And so with an interest towards catching up, you know, sort of from a, a we try harder, a little bit of a, of a behind position, um, you started to see coming together here academia and business. Um, Stanford was really, dare I say, Stanford was really uh, an early driver of bringing together the higher education um, work with the in industry here, Professor Terman and all of his disciples are often uh, pointed to as sort of the early founders, first of Shockley Semiconductors and then of the people that left Shockley, uh, the Fairchild Eight, the, the infamous traders who took off from Shockley and started their own organization uh, just as NASA was being formed and as the world was being transformed by the, the notion both of transistors first and then these, these silicon chips, this, this idea that you could actually get all this computing power down to just one thin wafer. And with that came then a real um, magnet for innovators. People who wanted to be making and creating things in this space were drawn, I think, to Silicon Valley and saw it as an opportunity to be here uh, at sort of kind of ground zero, if you will, of, of an, inner, an innovator's um, delight. And in this community, we point back to Hewlett and Packard are probably the most obvious of the leaders that emerged, the business leaders that emerged. But the important thing about Hewlett and Packard and the company that they built was that it was values-based and that from the beginning as the Valley kind of emerged in the business realm, there was a real significant commitment to not just what was being done, but how it was being done. And that was as much of the culture and the lore of Silicon Valley from the start as anything else. In the 1970s and 80s, you saw the shift to microprocessors and desktop computing, and also the arrival of the venture capitalists. Um, most people in this valley know that a RAPNET was the precursor to the internet, and most people at a uh, university probably know that it had university roots, and um, that was the beginning of bringing it together. So those things were developing on college campuses across the country, and here in Silicon Valley, there was sort of a, a new way of 
development that was also coming to the forefront. And I note it with the, the existence of something called the Homebrew Computer Club, but that's just one example of both collaboration and competition finding a way to reside together in the valley. So the people who were in some ways competing to get that first patent or that great idea to market were also sharing ideas. And uh, a rap net was the beginning of that, was sort of a mechanism for sharing ideas uh, across college campuses in academia and then here in the valley there was just this hey let's roll up to somebody's garage or dining room table or um, some local watering hole and let's talk about what we're learning and bring those ideas together and so again back to Hewlett and Packard I think it's important for us to remember that those that kind of work can only happen if there's a code that's emerging and and that and if the way of doing business is just as important as the business that's being done and that was happening here Kleiner Perkins arrived on Sand Hill Road in 1972. And so from that, you see the rise of the importance of the share owner. Kirk mentioned um, the sort of period of time where there was both stakeholders um, and shareholders. But this is really where you start to see that having a share in something, having an ownership piece, um, takes prominence and becomes very important in the way that decisions are made in investing and in growing and developing companies. Apple goes public the, the year I arrived, uh, I'm sorry, in 1980. And um, Xerox Park I mentioned because it's a way of bringing together companies that really feeds this whole collaborative, competitive uh, juju that's going on so that um, you might be going to the same cafeteria as people in another business enterprise and sharing your ideas over lunch, but then you're going back to the company that you work at in a, in a place like Xerox Park and others that have uh, sprung up around the valley. And that's different. That, that You don't find that in other business centers. Um, maybe the weather doesn't support it in other business centers like it does here. Um, but it, again, it's just that part, uh, part and parcel of the way business gets done in Silicon Valley. In the uh, 1990s and 2000s, we sort of see the rise of the internet, its bubble and its burst. Um, new companies and new platforms really emerge, Amazon, Google, and Facebook. And there's an increasingly diverse workforce here. So a third of the scientists and engineers that are working in the Valley are from other countries. Uh, they're not just from other parts of the United States. They're coming from around the world to, um, as I like to refer to it as sort of the beginnings of um, Silicon Valley being the public square of a global village. We're connected increasingly to countries and people from all over, uh, but they're coming here to do their work. Increasingly young leaders, uh, and the mismatch there or the um, challenge there is that you end up with folks who are running companies sort of far ahead of their life experience. So they, they may not have yet sorted out making commitments um, to marriages and children and, uh, and even institutions, but all of a sudden they're responsible for creating systems that other people will do those things in without having had the experience themselves. So that's, that's a challenge, and um, many of them have wisely sort of partnered up with people who have more life experience, and some have struggled um, for when they have not chosen to do that. You see in this stretch of time, stock ownership uh, in the form of share, uh, stock options becomes prevalent in the Valley. And this does two things. It creates some instant fortunes for the people who found the companies and all of a sudden I think kind of feeds that rock star mentality that Kirk was mentioning earlier of uh, you know waking up one day and finding yourself with unbelievable wealth. But it also distributes it differently. So it's also possible that someone in a far lower level position than we might see today now that stock options are not used in the same way that they were during this stretch. Um, you know, people that didn't imagine that they would be able to buy a home uh, have enough in stock options that they can actually um, advance. And you see some movement in the system uh, that, frankly, that we've lost a little bit since um, those have not been part of it. Following the, the crises that Kirk mentioned, 
Enron, WorldCom, and so many others, um, there's a rise of regulation. And Sarbanes-Oxley and Dodd-Frank are the two that get talked about the most, but really there's many shifts that influence the way that businesses are being asked to look at their compensation, look at their um, policies and practices, and really a requirement for transparency that wasn't coming forward any other way. And governance becomes much more significant in this phase. So how, I, how this shows up for, for me in the work that I was doing at the time, uh, I started at American Leadership Forum in 2000, and I left in 08. Um, and when I first started working there, uh, I was working with largely American Leadership Forum or uh, executives that are in CEO positions in a variety of sectors, public, private, nonprofit. And so the CEOs at the time that I would have been encountering would identify themselves that way. I'm the CEO of XYZ Company or even I'm the retired CEO of XYZ Company. That's my primary identity is that company that I led as a member of the management team. And they could be sitting on two or three boards at that time, but they would not have mentioned that. That would not have been part of the way they would have seen their roles and responsibilities in the business sector then. By the time I left in 2008 and on the backside of the, these regulatory changes, it would probably be the first thing they'd say. I'm a board director at, and then list the companies that they serve on the board of. And they might not even ever mention the company where they served as CEO. So the governance role and the, what it was requiring of people really shifted in that stretch of time so that it was a, a primary identifier and a legitimate uh, leadership role that emerged um, in companies and in the leadership uh, of Silicon Valley. And something that I think we're still trying to move from the kind of the clubbiness, oh, I know somebody, so I get invited to a board, kind of network building. Um, but we are seeing progress in that area because it has become um, such a significant job, takes up so much time, and has such um, identifiable responsibilities um, that were there before, but these regulations really drove those home. So then to the, the 2010s, that doesn't still roll off my tongue, um, there's, uh, the valley continues to grow. And platform solutions like LinkedIn and eBay and Facebook emerge as uh, great investments as they bring in more users and more apps and different things that you can do all on that little phone that you're carrying around or now that watch that's on your wrist. Healthcare and higher education start to feel the impact of um, the kind of disintermediation that the internet has brought to other industries. But here in Silicon Valley, and sort of back to the, the introduction that Father McCarthy offered, you start to see these real um, sort of paradoxes, this incredible wealth in the same community where we also have the largest homeless encampment that's known around the world as the jungle right here in Silicon Valley and an income gap that uh, if you're talking with any of the social service safety net agencies in the valley, they can tell you most of them have some kind of visual or they'll uh, map out kind of the incomes of the people in the valley and there'll be this bright red strip right down the middle of it that are um, people really living here below the poverty level in growing numbers. And the middle class um, really increasingly finding that it doesn't have a home in the valley, that it's either commuting from some distance to come in and serve here, um, but it no longer feels a part of the community as it, as it might have. So that's some sense of what was going on in the valley um, over those years. Kirk and I are going to talk a little bit. He's going to share first some historical perspectives uh, in Silicon Valley, and then um, we'll talk a little bit, hopefully, about some hopeful things. Don't go anywhere. We're, this is going to be quick back and forth. This slide simply presents some of the traditional leadership issues. Starting back uh, about 1988, I began to lead once a year a seminar of 20 leaders in Silicon Valley under the auspices of the American Leadership Forum. It was a creation of Paul Locatelli, president of Santa Clara, uh, this American Leadership Forum. He was the first chair. Uh, <coughs> Paul wanted to see ethics as a major part of it. These concerns, these 11, which were most commonly discussed when I asked what are the ethical issues that you're facing, I would call traditional leadership kinds of ethical questions my team versus others, favoritism in organizations, using one's network in proper or improper ways, 
Uh, number seven, suspending the rules to show compassion. When do you violate your own rules? These are tried and true leadership ethics questions that were being contended with in the Valley. Now, uh, Ann's perspective is that things began to change. So then this is just sort of an updated list of things that are on people's minds now. I've already referenced the fact that our local companies are all global players. And so for a pretty significant stretch in the Valley, that meant that their interests, both in terms of um, identifying social causes and other shareholders and stakeholders to be concerned about, um, extended beyond the Valley. So you'd see a company like Cisco, for example, which I think is still the Valley's largest employer, and they would pick something like hunger as their sort of cause um, for the company to rally around because it's global. There's hunger everywhere, and that's great. And here that meant that they um, connected with the Second Harvest Food Bank, and then in other parts of the world they identified organizations that they could uh, partner with there. But then that sort of allowed them for a stretch to say, hmm, well, if, it, if we can't put a global patina to it, if there's some way that we can't tie it up with some bow that works for us because, you know, we're a global company, we're not going to do much about it. And so then there started to be a, a pretty considerable gap between the leadership that we used to see from corporations in their own backyard and the leadership that we saw here in the Valley from the companies here. Increasingly, as I say, the, I talked about the diverse workforce, local um, employees or global citizens. So the transfer of wealth in philanthropically, there was still a fair amount of people here who were sending their money out of the valley. It could be back to another country to help a family there or a set of issues there. It could be back to another part of this country where they came from their alma mater, someplace that they identified as being responsible for their success here. We are still seeing everybody waiting with somewhat bated breath for the, the generational transfer of wealth to come that will come in the Valley, even though folks are a little bit impatient for it. And the real issue here is that, frankly, just not enough people have died. But when they do die and they have, leave their money uh, to the next generation, um, you will start to see the kind of community wealth be truly the community's wealth in a way that we just haven't experienced yet. We have the largest community foundation uh, in existence in the United States, but most of the people that have contributed to it are still around and they can still advise where that money goes. And so until they do pass away and until that money does really become money that is looked at and distributed by the community foundation, by the community foundation for the community, you're not really seeing potentially some of the uh, addressing of common good issues that you might see while, while all those pesky wealthy people are still with us. So anyway, but, they, but it's great that they contribute and that they set it up for futures to come. So, um, and then I, Kirk's already talked about the brand of me, but I think we do have to make a, a point about social media and um, the fact that people now, particularly in leadership positions, but all of us, you can't assume anymore that you've got this sector of your life and then that sector of your life. Once you're out there, you're out there. And for the leader, certainly the implication is you're always on. There's no downtime or private time that isn't being recorded or transcribed. Uh, am I next? Couple, yeah, couple sure. Oh, yeah. So the good news, uh, at least the way that Kirk and I have characterized it. And many of these you'll see, and Kirk will uh, be more specific in a moment, about their ties to the Ignatian values. But many of them are supported by um, uh, an Ignatian perspective. The millennials who seem to get a little bit of a rap, I notice, uh, uh, on campus and around, and I actually think are doing a great job of bringing forward a far more balanced perspective. And uh, the way that shows up in the business world is sort of demanding a humane lifestyle and a set of norms that are different perhaps than the ones that we experienced, but that will serve the entire employee base well. I've already talked a little bit about the development in Silicon Valley philanthropy still to come, but we have seen tremendous generosity from those young leaders. We're seeing the development of Encore careers. Retirement itself is sort of changing. It's not the way it used to be. Um, and people find something to do after their um, first pass, if you will, and in many cases it involves serving others. 
all the data that we have, the social media and big data and otherwise, uh, kind of forces the issue of transparency. So organizations and people in them who might have been able to make a lot of decisions and take uh, pretty significant action without that, that being known have a much harder time doing that now. We identify an, an intellectual awakening. Publishing is easier. There's more to read. The New York Times had a piece a few weeks ago about the fact that people just, I don't even have time to watch TV. I have so much to read, which is kind of a refreshing uh, perspective for those of us that write as uh, part of our work. Um, but there does seem to be a real interest in, in sharing ideas and reading uh, about perspectives from people that are considering and studying the same things that you might be. There's a high demand for talent that should drive egalitarianism. Uh, as someone on one of our business ethics partnership panels said last week, this should be the end of snobbery. You can no longer turn up your nose at the engineer that comes, for example, from Indiana University. You'll have to hire them, and they're good people, uh, instead of the local companies simply going after the students that are coming from a few of the more high-profile schools. And then the new business buzzword of the day, uh, if it was emotional intelligence uh, previously, is now mindfulness, which really has its roots in discernment and in the, the notion of taking an intentional break and becoming fully present and paying attention to the, the moment that you are in while you are in it. Um, and certainly there's, we feel that's a positive development. And the last slide was provoked by Ann pointing out to me as we went home on Friday. You know, in the description that uh, was handed out, they say that we will draw on the Ignatian resources to solve all of these issues. And so over the weekend, I did a little more research on Ignatian resources. And here are uh, a number of themes, seven themes that I think are right on target of what the Valley needs right now. The notion that everyone is a leader. This isn't just people who are paid millions of dollars, but that everyone, particularly in a uh, social media uh, empowered world, uh, has the potential to be a leader. Leadership springs from within, from who I am, not just what I do or what my degrees are or whatever. We need much more of a sense of that and the egalitarianism that uh, uh, Anne talked about. Leadership's not a job, it's a way of living. It isn't just a matter, uh, this ties to everyone as a leader, it's not just a matter of I got a job as a president or as a, a VP or whatever, but it's a way of living. Leadership is a lifetime task and a process the movement to governance, the movement to encore careers, the end of retirement um, is, is part of this, this sense of leadership is a lifetime task. I think that's a good development, but it's very Ignatian in its focus. Discernment, is, as uh, we talked about, of what God asks of me, my strengths, the needs of the environment. Creation of environments filled with love and mutual support. An increasing focus back on culture. Uh, we're, de we're detecting some increasing focus on culture that hasn't been there for a number of years. And then finally, the, the modus, the total surrender to your calling, to even a heroism as you uh, pursue what you think is your calling and your willingness to pay whatever price to uh, make happen what you believe to be important. So those all fit the context, in our view, uh, that uh, uh, Silicon Valley needs today. So with that, we're going to sit down and open it to questions from you. Thank you for listening. First of all, thank you very much uh, for being here and for, the, for this very um, clear presentations, uh, both about leadership in, in the larger context as well as Silicon Valley. I know that uh, it's a good group today, so uh, we would just like to open it to the floor. And I'll be, I, I, you can take questions as you like them. I don't need to moderate. I, I will just be the timekeeper. I, I, both of us read it as a part of our preparation for, for this, and I think our general sense was, yes, it is an ambiguity of the valley, that at the same time that there is huge generosity of philanthropy and so on, there is this 
huge sense of neglect around the inequalities and uh, uh, the concerns for the immigrant, the empathy, and so on. So uh, we, we're in a moment where the valley could go either way, uh, where all of these crises are up for, for grabs. I think I commented already and, and believe um, that it's great, first of all, that there are journalists who are um, calling these sort of anomalies uh, to our attention. And I actually, it made me go back and look at previous things that that particular journalist had written. Um, and I would say he's got a bit of a message he's working on. So that's, um, it's good to see that he continues to bring that forward. Uh, I would, I see some hopefulness in the role that some of these uh, young leaders that I mentioned earlier, they're a little bit out of sync with um, kind of the life experiences that you typically see of someone who's got those responsibilities, but they seem to be catching up quickly. And so um, maybe some of their choices aren't the most strategic or and they might handle them differently down the road, but to see them make um, significant gifts to global crises in the moment, 25 million to Ebola here and XYZ um, efforts to uh, the Nepal earthquake there, um, that, that's encouraging and it suggests that they understand that they're, they're going to have to act. They can't just sort of sit and expect that it will resolve itself, that they're going to have to bring their own leadership to those issues as well. I guess the thing that was most striking to me was the, was the quote from the psychologist, the social psychologist who was suggesting that excessive wealth does lead to uh, a, a narrow focusing on oneself, right? This, this me, you know, I think you called them the, the, the brand me, of me, the brand of me, uh, which was very striking to me because as a Jesuit and as one who has been engaged in Jesuit education, really, from the time I was a kid, it struck me that one of the messages that I was consistently given in Jesuit education is that precisely it's not all about me that the whole goal of education is to become a man or a woman for others. And so I guess I took it as a, as a challenge as well as a marker of just how important what it is that we, how important what uh, our, our core educational values are to the larger good. You want to speak up so people can. Uh, can Here, you, you, you want to grab the mic. I think one of the critiques of the Valley has been that what people don't do in terms of leadership and business, they sort of pay back their philanthropy. That, that uh, when you were talking about um, you know demand for more humane lifestyle, that that applies at the higher levels, but that the bus drivers and the security guards are unionizing now because they're not finding that the you know leaders of companies are looking out for humane lifestyles for them. So um, I, I I just want to make sure that we expand the discussion beyond philanthropy uh -huh. to what business leaders do um, for their communities. Kind of what you started yeah. with, Kurt, as as leaders of business. Uh -huh. Well, there, there's an interesting phenomenon, which is if you went back to the 50s and 60s, the dialogue was all about building great companies and the notion that one built a community, built a culture, built an organization that served multiple purposes and stakeholders. Whereas in Silicon Valley, other than Hewlett Packard and some of its progeny, the language is much more, this is not a company, this is an investment vehicle. Uh, and one builds the company, hopefully you cash out in a very short period of time, take your millions and go. Um, I, I was criticizing one CFO who was a good friend of mine a number of years back, and that was his response to me. Kirk, you've misunderstood. You're expecting too much of us with our companies. These aren't real companies. These are investment vehicles. Uh, and I think that's unfortunately a part of the mentality is uh, what's a good outcome when you found a Silicon Valley company? It's uh, growing it for three years and selling it to Google. Uh, and presumably Google should be developing the great culture, but nobody else in the valley. Now, whether Google's doing it can be debated. There, there are many more signs of building a culture at Google than there are in other places. Now, they do go to philanthropy. Uh, one of the joys of my last 15 years is I'm, I'm, I've served on the foundation of one of these instant millionaires who had, uh, billionaires who made a number of billions of dollars at age, um, what was he, 30 four at the time, 33, and was one of my students uh, at Stanford. And he looked to the senior folks 
Uh, he had a bunch of us old folks on the board of his foundation. Uh, and we've learned with him about philanthropy, but he has grown hugely into a figure at age 50 that uh, has great wisdom. And so uh, it is possible for them both to put the money to good use and to, to become wise themselves. This particular executive and I used to work together. Let's just point out that I stayed in the newspaper business, <laughs> he, and he went to eBay. Um, I did want to say one more thing, though, Irina, in response to your question. Um, I think there are examples, and I think they're um, – usually trying to blend a good business outcome with the development of more humane practices. But I look at a company like Netflix, which is growing and bringing more people to um, the South Bay in, the, in developing a different um, part of the community in terms of an employment base so that not you know everybody's driving uh, north to get to their job. And they, um, they went with a no vacation policy. So they sort of, there's this suggestion of we trust our employees. Now um, you take whatever time you need, just make sure that your, your business responsibilities are covered. Those of you that are familiar with um, business accounting know that that means then they don't have to carry the liability on their books um, for all the accrued vacation, and so there's some benefit to the business also, and it also means that when people leave, they don't owe them a payout and some of those practices. But I think that's a good example of a win-win and, a, and a, uh, the kind of policy that we're starting to see um, that I think is a return, if you will, to um, – the, the sense that we're all in it together, that there's um, everybody in the company deserves to have time off and time away, not just the people in the, in the top jobs. In fact, they might argue they get less. Uh, in the back? How about it? I, I think you'd find support for that, at least from me. I don't know about from Ann, but uh, uh, I, uh, intergenerational wealth is one of the great curses of one's life, uh, in my view, and uh, has stunted more motivation and accomplishment than it has enabled it. There is a question here. Uh, say that last part again, because... Because of the diversity in culture, do you think that's one of the challenging part, because of which there's so much of uh, leadership crisis, or do you think it's a benefit having such a diverse culture? I think it's a benefit overall. I think it's always a benefit to have as diverse a culture as, as possible. One of the things that I might have moved too quickly on uh, one of the points I was making in terms of the void of leadership is that you've seen, we've seen a shutout of women, for example, and people of color in certain leadership uh, roles within uh, pockets in the tech industry or in the tech industry more broadly. That programmers sort of um, culture that gets described um, by so many people who work in the Valley and feel like, you know, there's, there really is this um, network of men that it's very hard to break into. Um, and I think there's still work to be done there. But I think overall the cultural diversity in the Valley is a strength. But uh, how do you think this void can be broken and, uh, and be made more room for women as well to be a part of this? So I think some of it is data driven, and I back to the point that we made about the fact that data makes it harder for people um, to hide certain practices. Just the fact that the companies are feeling compelled to disclose what their numbers are currently is a move in the right direction. I think the recent high-profile Kleiner Perkins Ellen Powell case, while on the one hand um, she didn't prevail, on the other hand, a, a document of the kinds of, as they refer to, microaggressions 
oppressions or discriminations uh, that are subtle and harder to describe over time has been created just in the legal brief that exists now because of that particular case. And so it would be hard to deny it anymore. So I think we've taken a step in the direction of getting the data out, and now is the opportunity is um, what's done with the data. There's a question over here. One of our colleagues, of course, as you know, is Steve Johnson, who does character education. And uh, Steve has a program on raising an ethical child uh, and speaks often on that subject. I, I think the star system that we were referring to, which is that if you get to the top university and you get that great job and you stay on the top of the heap, you're going to be rewarded much more, has caused many parents to, to say, Everything depends on my child getting certain kinds of advantages while I still have control. And uh, as a result, I think we have uh, gotten into a trap of uh, communicating to our children inadvertently, if not explicitly, that nothing matters except success. Uh, and uh, this well-rounded serving and the joys and happiness that comes from empathy and serving other people is, is consistently undervalued. Uh, you know, one of the, the whole themes of Santa Clara as an undergraduate education is to try to communicate some of that joy. And you get through the Ignatian Center, this is your payoff, Thank through you. the Ignatian Center, <laughs> uh, you, uh, you get the opportunity to place those students out in nonprofits in the Valley. Uh, and uh, they get that kind of firsthand experience through the immersion programs in El Salvador and elsewhere, and so on. And all three centers have opportunities for that kind of engagement. But uh, I think that's what's necessary uh, as we raise our children. But it's the subtle messages. My, my, we thought we had done a great job with our three kids who are now 26 to 32. And every now and then, one of them will say, God, all you talked about was important people at the dinner table. And I thought we had really modified and we were very conscious of talking about good people at the dinner table, not uh, important people, but uh, it was still too heavy a dose for them. But they're all in service roles now. And uh, we take that as a personal chastisement of our style of child raising. Do you have a question here? <laughs> um, the question that I have is, you know, we're here uh, at Santa Clara University where spirituality can come into one's daily life, in, in, and, your, and your work is a call. Um, how do you reach executives who do not have that kind of a spiritual context, and, and I don't know, what works, what doesn't work? I, I guess, well, we both have reactions to this, I'm sure, but my perception is that in the philanthropic work that is going on in the Valley, there are aha experiences by executives who will get uh, Rockefeller Philanthropy Workshop West, which has trained a lot of the, the successful uh, wealthy in the valley, gets people out into the field. And that personal engagement is so central to giving people a philosophy of why it's important to help people. And even though much of that occurs without a religious context, it still has an effect on these people's notion of what's important in life. I would just say, for the most part, executives need permission to be able to um, connect with their own spirituality or centeredness or however they're going to define it. Uh, the expectations back to you're always on, but also always available, um, and the 24-hour clock of email and texting and everything that um, seems to require of them. I know that when I was at ALF, one of the early um, 
additional sort of course offerings that we put out there for folks who'd already done the first year program. I did in partnership with Andre Delbeck here at the university and it was called the Center Leader. And um, the people signed up for it, first of all, and committed to it in addition to the time they'd already given to the initial American Leadership Forum program. And they got as so enough out of that that now it's, well, I don't know, a decade ago, when I encountered the executives that participated in that, they um, mention it. They have specific examples of things that both tools and life practices that they built in. So it just suggests to me that um, we can continue to offer more opportunities like that for executives to, to take advantage of. We have time for probably one more question. We'll give it to you. Now the heat's on, I hope this is a good one. Okay. <laughs> um, when, uh, you think about Silicon Valley and what's made it what it is. It's really about the innovation that's here, the rapid success and failures that happen, and um, that there is this diverse workforce, even though they may not be at all levels. When you think about what we're trying to do with community and ethics and really having that kind of uh, philanthropic uh, community, it's really about valuing in inclusivity and having that community responsibility. Do, can you think of examples of a time or a place somewhere else on the, in the world where this innovation and this focus on community and good has happened at the same time? And, and what were some of the ingredients that made that happen? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the one that everybody points back to is the Renaissance. I, go ahead, and then I'll. Well, I mean, I, I mean, in in terms of characteristics, um, not in, in, not separate from good wine and good weather, but the, sort of the blend of academia and um, and business intent, but then a real commitment, um, sort of maybe to a Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Sort of once the basic needs of both individuals and organizations are met, there can then be a freeing up of resource and interest in the broader community and in the common good. I do think it requires people in leadership roles, just as we need to invite them to uh, give them permission to um, uh, focus on it some or make room in their life for it. Um, I also think it, it, anyone in a leadership role needs to be intentional about talking about the common good and uh, responsibilities that transcend any individual or, or their organization. And as I say, I do see some hopeful signs in the Valley and its younger leadership um, with incredible wealth uh, and an opportunity to do something who do seem to embrace that and want to carry that forward. They may not do it perfectly right out of the gate, but they're, um, they at least seem to have gotten the message. Quick final word? Besides my flippant answer. Um, <laughs> I, I was talking to a CEO the other day that I was raising money from, and um, uh, I, I asked him about his perception of the Valley and so on, and he said, why is it that some CEOs put off this engagement in social issues or even philanthropy at all until they've retired and maybe they're bored and so now maybe they'll do philanthropy? And he says, and there are others like me, and, and he's very proud of the fact that the day he started work out of the business school, he has been philanthropic. And um, I, I'm not sure, I, I don't think the commitment is as strong when you come to it late in life. Uh, I hope that it can be a characteristic of people right from the beginning, and I, I think that's why um, uh, college education and the, the formation of character early in life is so important. But nonetheless, there are some great examples, as Anne indicates here in the Valley, of both people who've had it from the beginning, not just Hewlett and Packard, but many others, and people who have come to it late and done it really well late. So um, I'm, I'm not so, uh, there's a room for both innovation and for this kind of service, I guess I would, I would contend. We need the innovation. It does make things more efficient. It does allow us the capability of doing so much that we would not otherwise be able to do for the poor and so on if we direct these things in that direction. And for a, an endorsement of our third center, the Center for Social Entrepreneurship, the Miller Center, of course, is all about applying those uh, innovations to the needs of the poor in the third world. Let's take a moment to thank our panelists, Sam Skeet and Kirk Hansen.
and to thank you for coming. It's very helpful to have your feedback so you have, uh, you have evaluation uh, sheets at your table. And those of you who are RSVP'd online, you will get a link in your email box. One final announcement, our, our very last Bannon Institute event for the year will be next Tuesday, May 19th where we will feature the Thriving Neighbors Initiative grant reports. Barbara Burns from Liberal Studies, Jennifer Merritt, and I will be speaking on the Thriving Neighbors Initiative and university community participatory research here in the Williman Room at noon. At 1 o'clock immediately following that, recipients from each of the grant projects will be hosting a poster session to share their work, so we very much hope to see you there. Once again, though, let's thank our panelists. And, and please do give us your ideas for this continuing work on leadership in the valley and ethical leadership in the valley. Thank you.